to introduce today's session, Unlocking Advanced RAG, Citations and Attributions, and our guest speaker, my colleague, Eugen Tang. Eugen is a developer advocate here at Zillis. He has a background as a software engineer um, working on AutoML at Amazon. Uh, he studied computer science, statistics, and neuroscience with research papers published to conferences, including IEEE Big Data. He enjoys bubble tea, spending time with his family, and being near water. Thanks for joining us today, Eugen. Welcome. Uh, hi, guys. Thanks for that introduction, Emily. Um, I'm really excited to talk with everyone today about citations and attributions with RAG. This is actually something that uh, I've been seeing a lot of chatter about in the last few months. And so building something around this and um, doing something around this has been really exciting. Um, my name is Yujin Tang. Um, I'm a developer advocate at Zillis, as Emily has said. I've put a QR code up here that you can scan. Um, if you scan this QR code, you can uh, it takes you to my LinkedIn and you can connect with me there. Um, my background is in machine learning. I worked with uh, CV and natural language processing before uh, coming to Zillis. And, and most of what I do here is focus on building retrieval augmented generation um, applications. So in a in addition to citations and attributions, if you have questions about LLM apps in general, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A. So today we're going to cover uh, just a couple things about citations. We're going to start with why do citations matter? We're going to motivate this use case of citations and attributions. Um, and then we're going to go into how you can build a citation engine. So in this section, I'm going to kind of cover the pieces of, I'm going to cover the process of a citation engine, and then what goes into a citation engine is more going to be covering the pieces of the citation engine. And then I have some FAQ at the end that are mostly about uh, vector databases. Um, and this is something that we can choose to go into or that we can choose not to go into um, because after the after section three, I also have a code example that we are going to walk through so we can understand what the code looks like for a proof of concept for a citation engine. So why do citations matter? Section one, this is the first thing that you need to know. Um, and basically citations are important because ChatGPT or any other large language model has hallucination problems. If you have been paying attention to the news, um, you've probably seen some interesting news around the use of ChatGPT uh, in or outside of industry in either academia or even in, in court. And uh, earlier this year, I believe this was in August or, or July, uh, a lawyer used ChatGPT in court and cited a fake case. And it says, this one says a judge is considering sanctions, but I'm actually pretty sure recently I saw that they are actually in trouble for this already. Um, and then, you know, uh, people have been also using ChatGPT a lot in academia, a lot of particularly undergrads, I guess have been uh, citing, have been using ChatGPT to write their articles and, and cite articles. And it just so happens that if you go to ChatGPT and you tell it like, hey, I need 10 articles about, uh, let's say, I don't know, like ancient Rome, you know, it'll, it'll like make up some articles. So some of them will be real and some of them will be made up. So this is a problem. Um, and the reason why large language models have this hallucination problem where they'll make up things is because they are neural networks. And neural networks are really just advanced statistical methods. And so in order to understand what's going on behind the scenes, we're going to stop here uh, before we go into citations, and we're going to take a dive into neural networks so we can understand what is going on and why they have this hallucination problem. So let's start by introducing a basic neural network. This has been around since like the 1960s or 1970s or something like that. Um, and essentially what, what I want you to get out of this is you're going to take some set of inputs. In this case, we have, you know, three inputs and these are usually numbers. So this is like a three dimensional vector is the input. Okay. And then it's going to get mapped somehow. They're going to do some transformations or some functions happening, blah, blah, blah. And then you get an output and your output is either going to be, it's going to be some sort of, usually some sort of classification. It is not always a classification. It could also be another prediction. Um, and typically, uh, neural network, but typically neural networks do classification. Um, and so this is basically all you need to know about the basic neural network is it takes some sort of numbers as input, does some sort of process, and then it gives you something as an output. And then 
as we moved uh, further into the study of neural networks, what we found is that particular types of neural networks work really well for uh, text and particular types of neural networks work really well for images and uh, for graphs or for tab tabular data or things like that. So different types of neural networks work better for different types of data. And for text data specifically, we have recurrent neural networks, which work well for uh, text data. And the reason why they work well for text data is because they allow you to keep track of input over time. So they allow you to keep track of some sort of context. And what this image here is, is the typical architectural image of what a recurrent neural network looks like. <clears throat> what I want you to understand from this image or what I want you to get out of this image is essentially each input output kind of uh, combination is looped back on itself. And that is how it keeps track of sequence. And that's how it keeps track of uh, words or tokens or inputs over time. And so in this diagram here, we see that there's this x minus, xt minus one, xt, xt plus one. And what this is trying to show you is that at input time t, you still have some information from your re most recent input. So essentially what this allows you to do is this allows you to create some sort of sliding window of context along your input. However, you know, this comes with two problems or multiple problems, but the two problems that we primarily solve, uh, that we primarily look to solve on the recurrent neural networks with the next architecture, the transformer architecture is that at, with this kind of uh, architecture, you're gonna lose context over time, right? There's a sliding window. And in addition, you have to convert the same number of, you have to have a sequence to sequence transformation where the sequence is the same length. Transformers kind of allow you to hit pause on that sequence sequence translation, as well as hit pause on your context and save that context into something that we call a hidden state. So transformers compose, are composed of an encoder, a decoder, a hidden state, an additional input. And this additional input is typically what we call self-attention. Um, and this is a matrix. And this hidden state is also a matrix, right? So it's just a bunch of vectors, right? And so the additional input, self-attention, it's just a bunch of vectors. Just think about it that way. Um, so essentially what the input, what the encoder does is the encoder says, hey, here's this input from, you know, whatever that, uh, you know, the text input. And what we're going to do is we're going to run it through some sort of calculations and we're going to produce a hidden a vector that tells you about the current context of the input, as well as the current token of the input, where is it, and the current state of the input. So basically it keeps track of the entire state of what's going on with the input. And it does this over time and it does this and it allows you to essentially do both global and feed forward context. And decoders, what decoders do is they take this context, they take this context when uh, they take this hidden state that you have that is the context of your input that includes you know, your tokens, where you are and things like that. And it takes your additional input. This is the self-attention matrix. And it puts these together. And then it produces an output. And typically what this output is, is right? So it takes into context where your token is. And so typically this output would be what is the next token. And that is exactly what GPT does. So GPT is actually a decoder only architecture. There is self-attention. There is like the full, you know, feed forward neural network like this thing. But what it actually is, is a bunch of decoder blocks. So Essentially what it's doing is it's taking the, the state and it's just transforming the state until it produces the next word. And so in this example, the chicken walked across. So what actually is happening is GPT will say, okay, the chicken walks across the road in a sentence. So what you want, what I want you to take away from this is that GPT, um, what GPT does is it, it takes advantage of knowing both where the next token is and the current state, the current context of the input. And it uses that to create the next token or the next output. So the reason ChatGPT hallucinates is because it's set up to predict a series of words or tokens. It is not a direct match. It is not a fuzzy match. It is not a search engine. It is an advanced statistical method that is set up to predict a series of words. Okay, so now that we kind of understand like what's going on with this, like. What is, you know, ChatGPT does this, like, how do we get, how do we, how do we, how do we get out of this? How do we deal with this hallucination? So it's, there's a few pieces to this. And, you know, one of those pieces is essentially you need to 
have a way to va verify or validate your knowledge. Where is this data coming from? And that's where citations come in, right? So citations allow you to say, hey, this is where I found this data. And so the basic process of this, this the first step in this is to, to basically inject your data on top of your LLMs, right? This is RAG. This is your basic RAG, retrieval augmented generation, is that you have data on top of your LLMs. And the basic process for this is you take your knowledge base, uh, usually, you know, text, images, video, whatever, you put it into a, a neural network, your deep learning model. It has to be a different model for each type of data. Don't use text models for image data. Um, you put it into your network, you cut off the last layer of the network, and then you get the outputs from the second to last layer. And that is your vector embedding. So that's where you get your vectors and you store it in a vector database. And that's basically how you inject data on top of your LLMs. With citations and attributions, we're gonna add an extra step in here. We're gonna not just store the vectors, but we're gonna make sure that we store the chunk text as well. Um, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So what I wanna talk about here first leading into that is like, what is this semantic similarity? Why are we storing vectors? What's the point? How are we gonna, how is storing vectors going to help us cite articles and find the right information in the right place? So let's cover this thing called semantic similarity so that we understand how vectors are able to find things that mean similar things. And so in this example, what I want you to look at is essentially that we vectorize these words, queen, king, woman, man, and we're going to do some math on them. So vectorization, the semantic similarity, what we're essentially doing is we're taking any sort of unstructured data like your text, and we're doing some sort of math on it. And so queen, um, we're going to start with queen minus woman. Okay, my image is covering this. Uh, and we're, what I'm going to show is queen minus woman plus man is equal to king. So we'll start queen minus woman. This is 0 0.3 comma 0 0.9 minus 0 0.3 comma 0 0.4. And this is 0 comma 0.5, right? So we can see here that, you know, queen and woman have the same value on the x axis. What this, or sorry, on the x value, the first dimension. Uh, what this essentially tells you is that these two words mean pretty much the same thing along that dimension. And another thing that you'll notice here is that queen and king and woman and man differ by the same in the second dimension. And what you can infer from that is that these words have a similar meaning or a similar difference in their meaning. And so when you do this kind of math, queen minus woman, you're going to end up with zero comma 0 0.5. What this uh, vector represents is essentially the difference between the word queen and woman. So if we take the difference between queen and woman and we add man to that, 0. 0.5 comma 0. 0.2, we end up at 0. 0.5 comma 0. 0.7, which just so happens to also be king. So the difference between queen and woman added onto a man is king. And so essentially what I'm showing you here is math on words. Words that are similar, can be added and subtracted to create other words that mean the same thing. That's the takeaway. Vectors allow you to do math on words. Okay, and so here, what does similarity search look like? So far, we've talked all the way through steps one and two, right? So we've gotten this unstructured data, we've turned it into a vector, we put it the vector embeddings, we've said that there's some sort of text that needs to be added to that so that we can keep track of the citations and we store it in a vector database. What happens next? How does this help? Once we have all of this, when the user comes and performs a query and the user says, hey, um, I want to know about, uh, you know, I want to know about the, I don't know, like the, the, the fall of Rome. I want to know about the fall of the Roman, the Roman Empire. I don't know. Uh, tell me about it. Okay. And then so they say that query, they go and they vectorize it. And then they get this query and they send it off to the large language model. And it says, hey, we need to find this. And then goes to the vector database and says, okay. We're going to find the closest things to the fall of Rome in our text, in our documents. And so what it is, is it goes in and it says like, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the nearest neighbors, fall of Rome. Oh, hey, look, uh, assassination of Julius Caesar, civil war, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now this is what we're going to return. And here's the cited documents. Here's, you know, where is this document? Where did we find it? We found it on, you know, this textbook or, you know, this whatever um, maybe you found it on Wikipedia. I know like most schools are like, don't cite Wikipedia, but I think it's actually not bad of a source. Um, but basically it'll tell you like where you found it. So you can either, you can establish like either like a, 
like this is a credible source and I trust it, or B, like this is not a credible source and I trust it. Maybe it finds information on the onion and you're like, hey, why is that even in my database? Like, I don't need that. Let's get that out of there. So uh, citations will show you where the data comes from. And the difference between citations and a typical similarity search is basically that we're going to add these texts into the vector database so that when we query it, we see the sources back. Um, and so the difference here is, you know, I wanted to, I just wanted to like take a second to look at what the data looks like in a vector database. I get a lot of questions about this. It's just, what does your vector database data look like? So you'll have metadata in JSON format, like you would any like blob storage or NoSQL database. The difference here is really that we're going to look at this embedding and this embedding is the, is a kind of key that you can use. And so the embedding is the approximate nearest neighbors key. And this is actually how the vector database is queried. And this thing that I've circled here is what I've called paragraph in this. So this is actually a screenshot of my data from a recent project that I've been working on. And the paragraph that it has extracted out is we define an anomaly as follows. And that doesn't have the rest of the paragraph in there, but uh, essentially what I want to point out here with the citations piece is that it does include a paragraph of text there. So that's kind of what the data for a citation looks like. And typically, if you don't have to do a citation, or if you don't have zero attribution, you do not have to save this text data. You only have to save the metadata that you need in your vector database. OK. So what goes into a citation engine, right? So I just talked about how the citation engine works, like what's going on with the vector database inside. Like, how does it actually pull relevant documents? What's an example of that? What goes into this? So citation engines uh, are a piece of the RAG stack, a part of the LLM application framework. Um, and essentially what we do here is we uh, define this framework as a CVP framework. We call it CVP. ChatGPT or any other large language model, a vector database such as Milvis and prompt as code. <clears throat> and so essentially what this, what you can, the way that you can think about this is you can think about this as a um, processor, a CPU, that's the chat GPT. This does all the computational stuff. It could, you can also think of it as GPU, computationally heavy work. And then you have a storage. So you have to have your data stored somewhere and that's your vector database, right? So this will be your hard drive, um, your ROM, et cetera. And then your prompt is code is essentially using the prompt to interface between you the CPU and the storage. So where do citations sit? In this stack, citations sit with your vector database and your prompt as code. So depending on the way that you have organized your project, um, your vector database may or may not be something that you automatically upload code to, or it may be something that you use a framework to upload, uh, sorry, not upload code, upload data, or it may be something that you use a framework to upload data into. So it could sit as part of the prompt as code if you have an AI agent, say, or something like that, uploading data into your vector database, you can prompt it to say, hey, we also want to include the, um, the actual text and the source and things like that. So that's one way that you can do that. But you can also do this directly on your vector database by just... Um, by, by just going into the vector database and saying, hey, like one of the fields we want to store is this text field. And this also kind of like plays out right before you store your data, right? So there's going to be some pre-processing for your data that you're going to need to do. And some of that includes things like chunking your data up into reasonable chunks. Um, this is something I've been playing around with is like, how do you find a good size chunk? What is a good crossover? Uh, what is a good overlap for your chunks? And actually, this is a difficult problem that... Um, no one in the industry has really found a, or, or even academia has really found a strong solution to. Um, but this is something that you're going to have to do and you have to experiment and figure out is how do you chunk your data correctly? And once you have your chunk data, how do you store that? So all your chunk data maps the same documents and things like that. So this is where citations sit. And now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at uh, an example notebook where I've built a very, very simple citation engine. Okay, so this is a QR code that you can scan to get to the notebook. Um, I will also be dropping the link in the chat. Um, but if you want to scan this on your phone, so you have the link saved somewhere for future use or whatever, I'm going to let you do that. And I'm going to give like 
10, 15 seconds, and then I'm going to um, open up the notebook. Okay, oops. Okay, so this is the notebook. Let's go back into full screen. Can I full screen this? Very cool. Okay. Okay, so this is the notebook that I'm using for uh, citation engines. And essentially what we're gonna do through this is we're going to, uh, you'll see that at the end we get this like cited response. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna scrape some data and then we're going to put that data into a vector store. And then we're gonna use an LLM and we're gonna put that on top of the vector store and we're gonna create a, uh, a citation control with that. Okay, so here I have all of this stuff uh, commented out because I had already done this. This is in the same folder that I have for my data for the multi-document querying engine. Um, if you uh, were there for that, then you should also you know have this data. If not, I will also drop the link to that. Oh, right. I said I was going to drop the link to this in the chat. Let me get both links to these and put them in the chat. One sec. So this one... So you can follow along with this. And then uh, I'll drop the other one in a second. This is the other one. So this both of these do this uh, scraping. Um, and essentially what we do here is we just get a list of cities. And you can pick any cities you want. For me, I chose Toronto, Seattle, SF, Chicago, Boston, DC, uh, Cambridge, and Houston. And then we just go to Wikipedia and we ping Wikipedia. This is Wikipedia's API, nothing really fancy here. Um, and this is also not something that matters unless you're you know, into web scraping. Uh, and then we get, we come down here and we get um, our OpenAI key. You know, so if you're gonna use OpenAI, load up your .env and then get your OpenAI key. Um, then we are going to import a bunch of things from Llama index. So this part matters. So first we have to import a way to interact with OpenAI, and then we have to import the citation query engine. So you can actually create your own citation query engine, but in this example, we're gonna use the one from Llama index. And we're also gonna need the vector store index. Of course, this is to hook up our vector store, Milvis, uh, a simple directory reader. So this reads the data from the data directory once you scrape it. Um, storage context, this allows us to pass around a reference to Milvis. Um, loading an index from storage, this allows you to load an index from storage. I'm actually not sure we use this one here. Um, and then service context allows you to pass a large language model around. And then we're going to need the Llama index version of Milvis vector store so that Llama index is able to access Milvis. And then we're going to just get Milvis Lite, default server for Milvis Lite, um, and we're going to start it up. Um, so from this one, I was using 2.2.11, but now we're on 2.3.0. Um, same interface, uh, so no change in that interaction. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to open up a connection to a vector store, to, to, to Milvis vector store uh, in Llama index. And I'm going to name this connection citations, and I'm going to have it you know, running localhost. And hey, I'm hey, Eugen, sorry to interrupt you. Is there a possibility that you might be able to zoom in on your cool. editor? Yes. I always forget that this is like really small to see. Yes. Is this better? It is. Okay. Um, cool. So let me, I'll just, I'll cover this again really quickly. I don't know if you guys got to see this. So uh, this is a way to interact with OpenAI. This is the citation query engine uh, functionality um, provided by Llama Index. This is a way that we create an index from a vector store. This is a way to read data from a, uh, from a directory. This is a way that we pass around um, the way that we store data, in this case, the vector database. This is a way to load an index. This is a way to pass around an LLM. And this is the Milvis vector store specifically that goes with Llama index. And we also, this is Milvis Lite, default server. We start it up. And then we create our Milvis vector store. So I've called this collection citations. This is localhost. And then we're going to just call default server to listen to the port. Um, we're going to create a service context here, and we're going to need 
basically we're going to get GPT 3.5 turbo, um, you know, pick whatever large language model works for you here. It's just that open AI is works easily by default with both, uh, Llama index and link chain. And so, you know, for this one, we're going to use GPT 3.5. Um, and then we're going to get a uh, storage context. And essentially what we want to do here is we want to have a storage context and we want to load up this vector store that we created earlier. Then we're going to use the directory reader to load the data. Um, so this is the data that we scraped from Wikipedia up here. And then we're going to create an index. So we create the index. We have these documents that we uh, that we um, that we scraped from before and we converted. And then we pass it the large language model that we're going to be using and the uh, vector database that we're going to be using. And then we're going to create a query engine. So um, what essentially we do here is we just go and we call citation query engine object. And what this does is this creates something that tells internally tells Llama index when you retrieve information, I want to know where the source is. And so that's what this is. So this is part of that, like prompt is code slash like, you know, kind of like interfacing piece in the CVP stack. And so what we're going to pass this is we're going to pass this the index that we want to use. Um, and then a similarity top K. So essentially what this is, is what are the top responses we want from the vector database? And we're just going to say three, for example, and this is, you know, how granular are the citations? And so in this example, we say 512 characters. And then we just say, you know, uh, does Seattle or Houston have a bigger airport? And it tells us, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then if we want the nodes, it'll print out much more information. And so, you know, you can see that where to get this information about Houston is it's like, you know, this list of things, you know, this section about Houston. So yeah, that's pretty much uh, what goes into a query engine and how you can build your own simple example with Llama index and why they matter. And yeah, so now I'm gonna open up the floor for questions. Thanks, Eugen. While we wait for the attendee questions to roll in, reminder, everyone use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. Um, so I know you've been working on this uh, a little bit uh, for a little bit of time. I'm curious, what did you find to be the most challenging part of um, of building this or solving um, this problem? Solving this problem, yeah. I think actually the like like I was saying at the at the at the end of the presentation, um, the most difficult part in creating an effective citation engine is actually getting your chunking correct. So it's actually your data pre-processing, um, which is really annoying because that is not like, that's like a area of uh, AI ML that is not very well defined and is not very well solved. Um, but that is something that is very important for your citations because you want to be able to get context that is the right context and you want to get it in the right context size window. Um, so that was kind of part of the hard parts. Uh, in addition, I built a few other versions of this. This was um, this was the one that this is like a version that runs on Llama Index. I did this. I did like another version where I just built it with just Milvis. Uh, and in that case, actually chunking was was actually more annoying. Um, and this one, this at least automatically chunked the documents for me. Um, but I think maybe another difficult part is just choosing what to store and how to store it. So for example, you don't just want, um, you don't just want to store the text. You also want to store like, where did I find this text? Uh, or who is the author? Or when was it published? Or things like that. And so a lot of these things um, just require more pre-processing and thinking and design processing than actually building the, the indexing itself. Jeremiah, uh, how difficult is it to add new data? Do you need to regenerate the vectors every time you add a document or can you add vectors incrementally? I'm gonna need more information on this question. Um, let me, okay. Um, I, 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 I don't understand. Uh, I, it seems to me like you have this, con and you can tell me if I'm wrong in the Q&A. It seems to me that you have this concept that one vector represents the entire data and adding new data requires you to add to the vector because that's where I'm getting the regenerate the vector every time you add a document. So vectors actually 
are the same dimension every time and they're generated by a um they're generated by a neural network like this right so the vector is actually this output layer from a neural network of the input documents so for example every time you add a sentence when you give this if you give a sentence to this network you'll get a four dimensional vector if you give a paragraph you'll get another four dimensional vector um so vectors don't change you don't add to vectors and adding new data is very easy all you say is hey here's my new data generate embedding um you don't need to regenerate you just need to generate it once and then you can store that into the vector database can you explain how you assign values to tokens again um yeah i actually i saw this question and i'm i don't actually understand it because you do not assign values to tokens so to the person who asked that question if you can if you can add a little bit more clarity um that would be great we'll we'll give that um another shot. Is yeah. this citation approach essentially just prompting the LLM to quote the parts it is reading from? Just prompting the LLM to quote the parts. Um, no. So actually that would be what this citation approach does is it says, hey, find me your sources. And as we know, LLMs have this hallucination problem. And so what this actually does is this says, hey, we're going to store the sources in a database. And then when the, when we retrieve those sources, we're going to include where we got those sources from and what the source is. So it's not just prompting the LLM to quote where it's reading from because the LLM doesn't read. The LLM just generates words. It does not read. There's no reading done by the LLM. For, um, oh. mm -hmm. Okay, for, for source one, what exactly are the sources? So in this in this uh, example that I provided, I did not. It was you can tell from the source that it's from Houston because it says Houston. Um, but I did not ask it to provide the. You can see Houston, but I did not ask it to provide the. Uh, the what should we call it? Uh, link. It is unclear what you built. You are using a citation query engine. Somehow, the message got lost as to what you built. Uh, so, a citation query engine is like a piece of this. It's like a. Mm, so, query engines are a piece of your large language model application. Essentially, what they do is they drive the way that you, that your application. Uh, sends queries to its database. And so the citation query engine is a piece of a larger large language model application, which is what we built here. This is a application that takes advantage of a large language model. We've injected a database. We've injected our own personal data. And in this case, our own personal data is uh, the Wikipedia files. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's basically citation engine is a piece of a large language model application. Uh, that's a better clarification. There's no consideration of other content when generating a vector. Correct. That is correct. Um, is this a matter of using a citation query engine from somewhere else or should we build one? Okay, you know what? It's becoming clear to me that I should not have used this example and I should have actually just built, I should have just used the raw example. Um, you can build your own citation query example. This citation query engine is just a something I pulled from Llama Index because I like the framework and I like that they've made it easy to um, to essentially you know implement this citation stuff. Um, but you don't need to use an externally built uh, citation query engine. Essentially, what you need to do with this is you need to a you need to remember to store your um, to store your, your source data, and B, to declare that you want to see your source data when you do your query. So there's really two pieces of the citation query engine. And I mean, this one also handles the chunking. So you also need to handle chunking your data. Um, but there's only a few pieces of it. And you can build it on your own. You do not need to use another one. I simply used this one from Llama Index because I like their framework and I think it's cool. Uh, do you have any chunking strategy recommendations for a tree-based document structure, think DOM tree or parent-child-grandchild, to enable more specific citations and context? 
Uh, yes, actually, um, I mean, this isn't necessarily chunking related, but in terms of tree-based document structures, um, I've been working on something with knowledge graphs uh, and putting a knowledge graph on top of a vector database. And actually we have a customer that does that, Origin Trail, put a knowledge graph on top of Milvis. Um, the chunking strategy or the strategy that I would recommend here is really to keep the metadata from your nodes in the entries into your vector database. So for example, your nodes probably have some sort of metadata such as parents or left child or right child or, you know, child or, you know, whatever. Um, or, you know, grandchild, I don't know if you keep track of that, uh, that relationship, you don't need to, but you could, I guess. Um, so your nodes will have some of this in the metadata. And essentially what you want to do is you want to ensure that you put these into your entries so that when you get your entry queries back, let's say you're going to query and you find that, Hey, like this is my entry back. Now I have, um, information that, uh, you know, this is a text and this is a child and this is a child node of this parent node. So what you can do then is you can then say, okay, well, you know, we have part of this text, but what we can actually do is we can go back and query the parent node as well. If we need more context for the information. Right. Um, so yeah, the, the, what you, what you would want to do with something like that is you want to have a way to link your chunks as well as, um, cite them. Uh, the class you set up has the main parts, the LLM and the source document, uh, the last gets vectorized. The LLM is a black box. So how do you connect a document as a source to the output of a query? Are you doing a similarity search in all the document vectors with the prompt response? Um, so the way that this kind of application works is that you give, you send a query and the query is then turned into like you, you okay, uh, you, so you ask it a question in natural language. And then what actually happens behind the scenes is that this question that you ask in natural language, such as, does Seattle or Houston have a bigger airport gets turned into a query or a series of queries or a set of queries that basically say Seattle airport, Houston airport, and then size. So it's actually taking the natural language question. The, L, what the, the role of the LLM is to take your natural language question and understand that question or break the question down into queries in which then you can go into the vector store to query against those queries. And that's how you do similarity search on the document vectors. And so that's kind of, I think that's kind of what you're getting at with the prompt response part. part. Um, but the way that you connect the document as the source is that you put the document, you vectorize the documents, right? You have the vectorized documents, you put them into a vector database, and then you query the vector database with the, the, the question, which is where the role of the LLM comes in. And then at the end, you just, you, you turn that into a response like this. And then once you have your response, you say, where do we get this information? Okay, let's, let's get this information. And so that's kind of how that works. We have another question in the chat. How does the program assign values to tokens? Does it assign the same token values the language model has for each word slash token? Asian, I, your, oh, there's your audio. Sorry, your audio cut out for just a second. Oh, uh, okay. Um, I, I'm having a really hard, I'm having a really hard time like understanding what this question means. Um, the, like, uh, at no point in our program do we assign any values to tokens. Uh, Tokens are um, tokens are 
like uh, oh you know what here I'll, i i have a i have a visual for this here we go in this example here tokens are these words in reality this example is a very simplified example in reality tokens are words or pieces of words that your network has defined as a single building block of language. So for example, V is probably a single token, but chicken is probably two tokens. It probably says this is like chicken or chicken. I don't know. And then walked is probably two tokens. It's probably walk the and says this ed token means past tense and this walk is like a, a verb like so then it puts these together it says walked is a past tense walking you know whatever uh across might be one token uh the the is once again probably one token road is probably one token so token is is token tokenization is, is actually a it's a pretty complex process um the way that it essentially works is you're running a ton of data into your language model and it says, hey, like it looks like from all this data, this is a single thing, a single like building block that I can identify as the smallest building block of these separate words. So spaces, periods, pu punctuation are often also tokens. Um, and just to finish this question up, uh, does it assign the same? No, not every language model has the same tokenization. Okay. I'm I'm working on a similar use case as you. Knowledge graph vertices embedded into Milvis to be used in a RAG app whose response must contain citations. Ha! Yes. Thanks for the chunking strategy advice. Any other advice on how to use Milvis more efficiently while scaling? Any recommendations on which indexing algorithm to use for tree-based embeddings, which contain child references in metadata? So I wouldn't even embed the tree thing, by the way. The tree thing should live entirely in your metadata. Just embed your text or your images, whatever. Um, and to use Milvis more efficiently while scaling, um, well, Milvis is actually built to scale really easily. Um, this is going to be the part where I just like, you know, advertise Milvis to you, but like Milvis has like these three separation of concerns where it's like, con it separates your indexing, your data ingestion and your querying. So because it already has this infrastructure there, what you really need to worry about is like the Kubernetes pods and, co and connecting them and saying, when do I, when do I spin up a second pod? And to do that, that's mostly monitoring. And that's mostly like knowing your use case and knowing how your app is being used, which is really like not, not really related to vector databases. Um, and so what you probably want to do there is like just that's that's going to be more like load balancing. Uh, another thing you could do is if you get to the point where you're just like, I don't want to work with Kubernetes anymore. I don't want to do DevOps. I don't want to make this scale. Reach out to our sales team. They'll be more than happy to talk to you um may you share a row view in milvis for stored citation data i that is what that is what this is i think um unless you mean like well this is row i mean these are json form i guess you can think of this as tabular data um but this would be a this would probably be i guess a row in tabular data would just be a bunch of the same ids over and over again right uh, but this is essentially what your data looks like, what one entry looks like. Um, how many hidden states does USA have? Oh, oh, kidding. Okay. As users' natural language inputs can be quite wild, ranging from some keywords to a very descriptive instruction or question, any recommendations on taming them to something that will pull back useful information? Who, uh, I, I want, I want additional uh, information on this question. I want to know who your users are that have such a wide variety of things and why that might not result in pulling back useful information. Um, typically, I think I think that if you are using this internally, then you're going to probably want to do some sort of like prompt engineering that'll just be like, hey, you know, Every time that you just have some rules, just have some rules, you know, like, hey, every time you want to look for something, include, you know, this sentence or include this set of words or include this link or something like that. 
Um, if you're having external users, then, uh, I mean, then you're 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 up a creek without a paddle. Um, any recommendations on which indexes to use? Oh yes, for your knowledge graph use case. Uh, it depends on how much. So all the indexes, like the differences in the indexes, are mainly just trade offs. So it depends on what you need in terms of um, accuracy, speed, and memory. So for example, if you need really high accuracy and you don't care about speed and your memory is agnostic, just use a flat index. If you need really high accuracy and you care about speed and you don't care about memory, then you would use HNSW, which is the most popular one. Um, if you care a lot about speed and you don't care as much about accuracy and you care about memory, then use some sort of quantization such as scalar quantization or product quantization with um, IVF. Um, scalar quantization is, you know, or product quantization means you care more about memory than scalar quantization. Um, yeah, so it all depends on the trade-offs you need. We have another question for you in the chat, Eugen. How simple is it to swap LLMs or vector databases um, for an example, using Falcon LLM or Pinecone DB. Um, I don't know about the other vector databases. I will say that it is not that difficult to swap using LLMs, as long as you can host it locally, and as long as you understand the interface, you can use an LLM, and you can just drop them in and out. All you need to do is change the way that you're uh, interfacing with that LLM. But typically, all you're doing with the LLM is putting it into a framework. And so it's typically very easy to drop in and out. Uh, I do know that not all the vector databases have the same interface. And so you probably want to you know, learn what the interface differences are um, if you want to be able to switch between them. Um, so yeah, that's 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 my basically, you know, it's it's not that hard. You just have to learn all the interfaces. While we wait for more questions from the audience, do you wanna, I know you prepared some FAQs. Do you wanna run through those? Yeah. So we'll get back into slide mode. So, oh, we'll, we'll answer this last question here. Uh, are the sources perfectly accurate in the sense that there that is there a guarantee that the prompt responses really is sourced from the document presents it as a source? It's source in the document. Uh, you know, that's a really good question. I want to say that, like, yes, but once again, you know, um, large language models are neural networks, so they are advanced statistical methods. And just because you give it a source does not mean that it is not possible in some case, maybe 0.1% of cases, where it is going to give you a wrong answer back. Um, but I would say that this is very unlikely. Um, and you can actually make it so that if you prompt your LLM correctly, you should be able to get rid of that almost entirely. Um, but there is no such thing as perfection in software. I think that also brings up another interesting point of knowing where, knowing the source versus the accuracy of the source itself. You know, I think, you know, the onion versus, you know, the AP, you know, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a big scope in there. So I think that that's, you know, we need to kind of continue to remember that citations and attributions can help against some of this like hallucinatory misinformation. Um, but we need to remember that sometimes there that exists within the original source itself. Yes. Um, yes. Not all sources are the same level of trustworthiness. Um, the FAQs that I have are mostly pertinent to vector databases because these are, you know, this is mostly what I talk about. And so this is what I get a lot of questions about. Um, I will say the when not to use for citations and attributions also applies. Um, but the real like not to use use case is like, hey, you know what? <laughs> I don't care where this data comes from. I just want to be able to use a chatbot. Then, you know, don't use it. Then you don't need to. That's, you know, extra work for no reason. Um, when do you want not want to use a vector database is if you have only key value data. So if you were working with a bunch of key value data, um, you don't need you don't need similarity. So it's overkill. Um, OK, and then I see a lot of things around CSV files and PDFs, especially around vectorization. Um, it seems that there are not a lot of choices for models around CSVs and PDFs. And 
the challenge with vectorization is that you need to have a model that is trained on the same type of data that you're trying to embed or vectorize. And so there's not a lot of models that are trained on CSV or PDF data. Um, and so vectorization with these is difficult. With these, what I suggest is I suggest taking your CSVs and trying to convert it each row into a full sentence and taking your PDFs and converting it into text and then chunking that up and storing both of these as text. Um, finally, something that I get asked about every so often is hybrid search. And so hybrid search is how do I search structured and unstructured data together? And Milvis lets you do this through this thing called filters, where you can say, hey, I want to search for something where maybe the publication date was after August 1st, 2023, or something like that. So yeah, these are the FAQs that I usually get. And there's a couple more chats. Here. Oh, okay, no, there's not. Okay. Um, cool. So that's pretty much all I've got for this section. This is your last call to get in any additional questions for Eugen. Otherwise, we will wrap up the session. We'll just give you another minute. Um, but in the meantime, thank you, Eugen, for this really great session and, and walking us through it. Um, I think the being able to sort of spend some really thoughtful time with the audience questions was was really powerful part of this presentation. And we're really grateful for everyone who spent some time with us today. Looks like we've got one other. On the hybrid search, is there a way to add metadata to filter on? Yes. Um, in fact, uh, on the hybrid search, um, the, oh, I'm going to move the QR code real quick. On the hybrid search, there is, um, it, it is done on the metadata. In fact, it is really the only thing you can do the hybrid search on is by um, filtering on the metadata. Uh, and since we're on this topic, I'll just give you an interesting tidbit here. Milvis performs this hybrid search by applying a bit mask. And so there's no like, hey, we're going to search for this and then we're going to filter or we're going to filter and then we're going to search. By converting your filter into a bit mask, you can actually search and filter at the same time. It's really cool. So it turns your, uh, it, it basically cuts down your, uh, your query time by a lot. Yes, it is fast. It's basically because it's linear time, right? So it's really cool. I was like, wow. When I learned about that, I was just like, oh, this is, Really interesting. All right. I think that is our last question for today's session. Uh, as we mentioned, today's session was recorded, so you'll get a link to the replay. Um, Eugen, thank you so much. This was great. Great. Yeah, thank you.